So it's taken probably 24, 48 hours for me to just absorb the conversation that I had with Brian Crozer the other day. Probably because I was stupidly starstruck. Uh, you know, I studied uh, Brian Crozer's writings, teachings, etc. when I was uh, studying winemaking at university. Many people have. He is one of the originators of our industry, really, you know, during a period of the 60s and 70s where there was just mass experimentation happening uh, across all of Australia. He was establishing Chardonnay in the Adelaide Hills, which was in like the late 70s. He was one of the first people to focus on just single vineyard wines. So the concept that Clare Valley should produce Riesling, Kunawara should produce uh, Cabernet, as well as pioneering and really driving what we call the homocline model. So thus finding similar climates, what we call degree days through the growing season, to be able to understand and comprehend that a particular variety will go better in one place or, or another. For example, he has Pinot Noir and Flurio, he has um, you know Chardonnay in the Adelaide Hills. Honestly, I could go on for, for hours about the stuff that he's achieved from um, you know writing the enology course for Charles Sturt and heading up Adelaide University for like eight years amalgamating a bunch of uh, regulatory bodies into wine australia and becoming one of the founding board members for that and only recently did he uh, retire from that to growing one of the most successful wine brands and then have it taken away from him to then grow another wine brand to also becoming one of the most successful wine brands in australia again from the age of 53, 54, so absolutely fascinating individual, uh, very considered um, uh, and uh, opinionated in a great way. And I will say I personally took a lot from this conversation. Brian Crozer is one of the greats uh, from Australia, but not just to Australia, to the global wine industry. Some of the, pro he's very, very widely respected, very widely regarded if you know of any of his projects and we got the opportunity right over there to have him sit down and have a conversation with us. So I hope you take away uh, as much as I did uh, from this conversation, but uh, myself, Brian Crozer, enjoy the chat. Before we sort of begin, do you have any questions for, for us? No. <laughs> Cool. Yeah, we, we interviewed Peter Gago yesterday and I think he was a little bit vexed that he had a bunch of young young folks uh, interviewing him about wine that actually knew something about wine, <laughs> which I think was a bit of a new thing for him. But let's start straight off at the top. Um, does Australia need another Len Evans? Sure. We could certainly do with one, two, maybe more. But when he was made, they broke the mould, so there's no possible <laughs> chance that there'll be a repeat of it. Len Evans... He was unique, he, um, and I'll use that word quite a lot through this interview. He was unique in that he had a laser-sharp focus on quality and he judged Australian wine. His mantras were uh, line and length and improve the breed. And he judged Australian wine by his experience, vast experience at other people's expense largely, with the great classic vintages and classic regions of Europe. So he had that as a measuring stick. And unashamedly, he had the ambition, which I do too, of um, producing wines in a style, not emulating those of Bordeaux, Burgundy, Champagne, and beating the French at their own game. Because if you beat them at their own game, it's a very, very lucrative thing for the country. Do you think that the best wines from Australia have been made or yet to be made? Well, obviously not. Um, there have been some wonderful wines made, um, and especially by that group of Renaissance men in the 40s, 50s, into the 60s, so talking Morris O'Shea and Max Schubert and Jack Kilgar, um, Mick Napstein, that generation made some wonderful wines. Bin 60A is probably the best Australian. Penfold's Bin 60A, Max Schubert, blend of Kunawara, Cabernet, Kalimna, Shiraz. It's probably the best Australian wine I've tasted, um, alongside a lot of other 1962 wines, 59 Lindemann's uh, uh, Red Burgundy, um, and 62 Hardy's Cabernet from Ranella. Um, they were wonderful wines and I don't think that we've quite reached currently back to that quality because they were such small quantities from such low crop vines and vines that were planted by the pioneers in the 1860s, 1870s. Um, so they are very old vines when in 1962. So where are we with quality? Um, where are we going? I don't think we've even discovered the best regions yet. 
Um, That's really interesting. And climate change is going to obviously affect where the best regions are for each of the varietal suites, but Tasmania is still relatively unexplored um, and obviously for Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. And I'd say all that area in southwestern Victoria above Portland, Hamilton, Grampians, southern Grampians, probably the most, um, the best potential grape growing area, one of the best in the country that is undeveloped. So the next steps are to improve selection of site, selection of regions, and that'll happen driven by climate change, I'm sure. And then after that, getting viticultural perfection because we're a long way from viticultural perfection. Fascinating. I've got so many different side questions now because I mean, I'm fascinated to know what makes, obviously, in your mind, a, you know, a great quality wine. But also, you know, you referenced the original clones or original vines that were sort of brought in by these sort of pioneers as producing these, you know, amazing wines. Yet so, so far, we continue to see more and more clones, you know, uh, clonal material being brought into Australia as the answer towards quality. Do you think maybe we should be looking back towards either old vines that have adapted to site instead of having to, to move towards new clonal material? I think having the diversity and the choice mm. is wonderful and there's no question some of the old clone, some of the old selections because they're not clones are um, exceptional and I can talk about the Chardonnay in our Tears Vineyard that I planted in 1979 thinking it was OF which is a Californian University of California clone and I actually probably originated in Mudgy from Busby's collection at Kirkton and the Hunter, small residual of it at Hunter Valley Distillery and in Mudgy. And then when the Chardonnay boom took off, started to take off in the mid-70s, that was the source of a lot of material that was brought illegally into South Australia. So AWRI um, have proven it's not OEF. It may well be that old original clone brought in by Busby in the 1840s. Um, and it's a wonderful clone selection. It's a wonderful selection. So there's give and take. I reckon 777 Pinot is pretty good. And that's what you've got planted in Flurio? I've got 115, 777, 114, 828 and 667. So all, the- all of the Bernard clones, or not, not all of the Bernard clones, all Bernard clones. Mm. I was talking to uh, a couple of chaps from Kunawara uh, a couple of days ago, actually, just at, a, at, a, at an event, uh, and they planted their vineyard in 1968. And I was like, oh, that's really interesting. I'm, you know, talking to, to Brian Crozer this week, planting his vineyards in the, the sort of late 70s. What was it like back then? Because right now the concept of going, going to a new place, you know, a new area, planting a vineyard, even now makes me feel like a cowboy. Uh, mm. You know, back then it must have been, it's so much easier to conceptualise planting a vineyard in Kunawara or the Adelaide Hills now than it must have been back then. It must have just, people thought you would have been weird. <laughs> I was told that the Adelaide Hills would never grow grapes, because, or central Adelaide Hills, because of the rainfall and the temperature. And that's because most of the vineyard managers of the time um, were used to the hot, arid vineyards of... Um, of the inland, pretty much all the Kunawara managers came from Mildura um, and the South Australian r- Riverland. There was a lot of innovation in the 60s and 70s. I mean, Seppelts went to Kepok Pathway in mm. 1967 and Hardy's followed in 1969. Orange, the first plantings there were about that time. Obviously, it was later in the Adelaide Hills, 1979. The Pyrenees in Victoria, Cowra in central New South Wales is an exception, but a different sort. Mudgee had expanded. Yarra Valley had been reinvented. Bellarine Peninsula was on the way to being reinvented. So, um, And Carl Seppelt, who was responsible for Padthaway had also planted at Drumborg, which is in that area I talked about. The Drumborg. Yeah, yeah. Between the bottom of the Grampians and Portland on the edge of the Great Southern Ocean. So it wasn't so strange to go to a new area. In fact, out of our 65 regions, I think around 20 were invented between the 60s and the 80s. So it was sort of all the rage. Yes, it was all the rage. Yeah. It seems that innovation in the wine industry at the moment is more 
technological than it is about viticulture or agriculture. What's your sort of take at the moment on the the no alcohol movement or no alcohol wines? Um, I don't. It's ex wine, so it's not like, wine anymore. It's like <laughs> it's like Cleese's ex parrot. It's ex wine, <laughs> and it's competing with ex other alcoholic mm. beverages. So mm. I don't regard it as as wine in the sense that. Len Evans would have said, this mm. is fine wine that I believe is fine wine. It's a legitimate product and it's got a, got a market and a growing mm. market. It's a byproduct of the wine industry and, and certainly not in my line of sight as something I have any, any ambition to be involved in without deprecating those people that are. Do you think, though, that it might move us away from the core values of what makes wine such a, a special, unique product amongst, I guess, the array of alcoholic products that you could choose from. Yeah, no, I don't think it's any different. No alcohol beer or no alcohol spirits, it's no alcohol. Um, and I'm not sure that um, wine will win that battle because there's a lot of money and technology involved in spirits and can improve the taste of no alcohol wines, of no alcohol beverages. So... Um, I don't think wine's got any advantage in no alcohol uh, section or limited advantage. So, as I say, not in my line of sight. <laughs> <laughs> well, obviously Chardonnay's been in your line of sight for a while. Mm-hmm. And uh, when I was at university, the thing that really sort of helped launch uh, our whole sort of wine brand um, was a big lick of confidence that I got from Peter Dry when he took us for an afternoon. Great man. Amazing man. Um, uh, very intellectual man. Mm-hmm. And he spoke about Chardonnay from a perspective of a person who had seen a world without or an Australia without Chardonnay, which for a lot of people now, especially young winemakers, we can't really conceive of Australia without Chardonnay. <laughs> yes. But, uh, you know, he spoke about making, I think his, his words were like, 1973, I was involved with the making of the first Chardonnay or something like that. I'm paraphrasing. And I thought, well, wow, like there was probably a time as well before the, the what we call the Savalanche, you know, the Sauvignon Blanc, mm-hmm. you know, explosion. Um, and that gave us the confidence to start looking at, at the time, uh, the alternate variety movement or appropriate variety movement in Australia, which really is just site selection anyway, um, irrespective of what variety it is. Mm. And it gave us the confidence to launch a brand that actually doesn't make a lot of Chardonnay, actually makes a lot of Fiano instead. <laughs> um, you've seen obviously the, at your inception, you're a Clare Valley boy. Mm-hmm. And you saw the at the time Riesling was all the rage, and then it wasn't. Yeah, it was mm. the glamour variety of mm. the whole industry when I arrived. So, winning the trophy for the best Riesling at any wine show was, was a, huge. Was a huge boost. And you yeah. saw obviously the rise of Syrah uh, and the yeah, fall Shiraz of it. Syrah has been there forever. Um, mm. Yeah, and the rise and fall of Sav, Sauvignon yeah. Blanc. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> What about, so Chardonnay, obviously where, you said there was a Chardonnay boom in the mid 70s and that, that must have From mid 70s through to late 80s when all of a sudden the glamour, the oversupply situation in the industry and Chardonnay was a victim of that because it was probably the most planted variety at that point um, outside Shiraz. Yeah, it was a massive growth. But it was also the era of fruit salad vineyards. So like everyone's planting everything all the everything time. Everything in the same vineyard. Um, Isn't that relevant? Sauvignon Blanc. And oh, in the same vineyard. Merlot. Just because they had no idea Pinot. what was going to happen. They were, it was really an era of varietal wine growth. Mm. So if you had the right variety on the label, it didn't matter where it came from. Mm. Uh, and it's the era when Rosemount established themselves, for example, and other new wine companies trading off the insatiable demand for varietal wines and they were they were almost exotic varieties when they first arrived but the um, consumers took them up took them up wholeheartedly and it was only after that boom of the 80s that people started to think about differentiation of quality mm. in each of the varieties do you reckon that fueled the sort of very large plantings of shiraz and chardonnay in the riverland that was in the late 90s, so mid-90s through to 2005, so 10 to 15 years. That was fueled by uh, executives. Uh, um, greed. Greed, <laughs> straight greed, by 
um, fast mo- consumer moving goods executives from the soap industry, from the brush industry, from Coca Cola, mm. who um, were on a conveyor belt come into the industry for a brief period of time and then be replaced by somebody else only on that conveyor belt to collect a bonus at the other end. Um, And they saw the growth opportunity and wrote all these contracts in the Riverland, which we now live with, um, Mm. and a 400,000 tonne surplus created by those very same executives back in that pre-2005 decade. So you've seen you ref, you know mentioned just before there was a an oversupply situation back in the seventies. Mm-hmm. We're obviously in an oversupply situation now. There's plenty of wine industries that have been in oversupply before. The French are familiar with it. The Spanish, the Italians. How how do we fix it this time? What's the what's the big fix? Yeah, well, we don't have the advantage that the French and the Italians and Spanish have, which is an EU government prepared to pay pay you to take the vines out and prepared to pay you to put them back again and to distill whatever surplus um, you have. Uh, So our government is definitely not going to do any of that. So we have to fix the supply through market, oversupply through market forces. Unfortunately, the oversupply, which as I said was created pre-2005, was obscured by the 250,000 growth tonne growth of the American market, which fell over at GFC and when Parker started denigrating Australian wine and the 250,000 Chinese boom from 2014 through to 2020. Those two th- two booms, bubbles, um, obscured the surplus of 400,000 tonnes, but they've gone. So mm. now it's naked, it's exposed, mm. and it's, it's going to have to be dealt with for the health of the whole industry. Yeah, it's, it's sort of funny. Uh, I was describing it to a, a friend of mine. Uh, we just I just finished reading this amazing book on, on Toyota and sort of how they sort of operate their warehouses. Mm-hmm. And uh, in typical uh, amazing Japanese fashion, they had always had on their books this car that they'd overproduced. They, they, sorry, they were missing one car uh, off their books. And they, they couldn't find it. And they thought it was a rounding error, said, but they kept it on their books for like, it was like 15, 20 years. So we're not going to take it off. We're not going to write it off. It wasn't an error. It can't have possibly been an error uh, until they had a new executive come in with a new sort of idea of managing stock levels in a sort of just-in-time basis. And in one of their windscreen um, warehouses, uh, he said, well, we're sitting on way too many windscreens. We're going to get rid of it all because we plan, we, we overproduce them and we, we have all this extra stock. It's costing us all this money and no one's going to use it. It doesn't really matter if we get rid of it. We should, we should deplete those stocks and expose all of our weaknesses so we can improve them. And uh, in doing so, they actually found this car <laughs> buried in this warehouse surrounded by windscreens. You know, it's it does seem that um, you do, and this sort of mentality um, in the industry at the moment, because a lot of people are obviously crying poor, but it does seem that the pain of changing is drastically becoming less than the pain of staying the same. Yeah, I hope that's the case. And I hope it's the worst vineyards and worst varieties and mm. that go. And obviously the Riverland is taking the brunt of this, even though the Riverland isn't the sole source of the surplus. And mm. a lot of the su- surplus is coming out of nearly half, coming out of the cooler climate areas, the Shiraz planted in Barossa and McLaren Vale and so on, during the Parker boom from mm. 2000 to 2011. Um but the onus then falls on the Riverland because that material out of the cooler areas displaces from yes. non-premium product, displaces the Riverland. Mm. So the Riverland gets the full brunt of the 400,000 tonne surplus. Uh, there's a grower around the corner here who's been acquiring vineyards because uh, on this side of the hills we don't have – I mean, we do have plenty of smaller lot holders, but on this side of the hills it was more, the, the, I guess, the workhorse of a lot of the, the, the Adelaide Hills plantings. You know, the Casellas came in and planted, yeah. Grant Burge came in and planted quite heavily. And a lot of these vineyards are being round up by one or two larger groups of growers mm-hmm. um, who – one in particular has or is planning to have a 1,000 hectares of Chardonnay planted through through the hills. Do you feel somewhat vindicated that, <laughs> that you know, since the 70s you've been banging on about Chardonnay in the hills and it seems like now it's, at least from what we're seeing, so many people are now just going, well, this is the default mode for, for the hills now is Chardonnay. Yeah. Adelaide Hills has um, 
earn the respect of consumers for Chardonnay and it is not a boom time but it's a sustainable a sustainable situation for Adelaide Hills Chardonnay. What I fear is further growth without quality improvement because the thing that will keep Adelaide Hills Chardonnay in the for, in the spotlight mm. and keep it earning a premium is quality improvement and quality improvement's mostly going to come from vineyard. Um, and so my real question would be of that person who owns the thousand hectares what are you doing about improving the quality of your grapes um, and uh, taking it to the best of the vineyards of Europe because mm. that's the opportunity that's actually interesting we presented a uh, master class at ProWine this year actually for the Adelaide Hills mm-hmm. uh, specifically in Chardonnay uh, and there was a group of MWs God bless them uh, in the crowd that asked a very pertinent question actually which was why should we support Adelaide Hills Chardonnay beyond South Africa, beyond New Zealand, beyond America? And it seems to be cheaper uh, and they seem to be doing very good at it, um, you know, and they're very good in market with it. What's the compelling sort of reason? Um, and it's I actually struggled to answer that question um, because it seems like the more that a single grape variety becomes omnipotent across a multitude of different countries, the ability for us to answer that question with culture becomes a little bit more difficult. Like how does Chardonnay fit within our culture? Can we sell Australia? You know, can we sell site? There's thousand hectares to sort of answer your question. It's all going to sparkling base. It's all 900 bucks a ton and there's no yield restriction. <laughs> yeah, well, it's sort of disappearing from the Chardonnay market, isn't it? In, mm. in the sense that... Um, it's not visible as table wine Chardonnay, which is where the big competition is. Not to say there isn't competition in sparkling wine, but it's more anonymous when it's in sparkling wine. Mm. Um, yeah. How do we differentiate from those other countries? Um, I think there is a unique Adelaide Hills character and there's definitely a unique Lenswood, definitely a unique Piccadilly Valley Chardonnay character right at the top end of the market um, and that's being proven through the Penfolds products, through our products, through uh, Jeffrey Grosset, through Jeff Weaver. You know, a lot of really, really top Chardonnay coming out of those two cooler parts of the Adelaide Hills. And that's sustainable because they are, they have their own character. They're not like anything produced in New Zealand, Mm. Um, they're not like anything produced, you have to excuse me, anything produced in the US or um, South Africa especially. Mm. They have their own unique character and that's the answer is differentiation and that's driven by terroir, that's driven by where the grapes are planted. And you're, of course, one of the first to really sort of pioneer the the sort of single site or regional identities of obviously Clare, Kunawara. Some describe you as having an iron will. <laughs> Would you self-describe yourself as that? You ought to meet the rest of my family. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a degree of, of iron will that you, you, you need to be able to do things differently in this industry? You need both pragmatism, flexibility and iron will. You need all three things. The iron will is the same as Len Evans' iron will about quality. It's all about quality and quality improvement, improve the breed. Um, I certainly have an iron will about um, the role of education, the role of research and development in innovation in our industry and its future. Uh, And I certainly have an iron will about trying to uh, elevate Australian fine wine into the same shelves and prices as Bordeaux, Burgundy, Champagne, Napa Valley. Um, uh, And I'd have to say that after five, nearly six decades in the business, I failed miserably. You failed? Yeah. I've, I've, I've always stuck to the message and very firmly and strongly, but the industry hasn't changed much. Well, the industry certainly, uh, I think it was said to me once by another chap that um, uh, the wine industry is a little bit like selling a propeller to Boeing, uh, <laughs> except Boeing's really interested in buying the propeller. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it is quite conservative, obviously, in many ways. Uh, I often see like a lot of anchoring 
like a lot of, you know, as you mentioned to before, like a lot of growers, when you want to introduce, I say, a new variety or a new method of farming, which isn't technically new either because these varieties are just as old as any other variety and the mm. techniques we're using, we're just mm. really borrowing and repurposing. You know, we've worked with, say, a... Um, uh, Nebbiolo vineyard in Clare Valley. We said, look, it needs to be cane pruned. There's there's no other way to really properly do Nebbiolo. Mm -hmm. It was also double cord and spur pruned at the time. Uh, and so they said, yeah, yeah, we can do that. We can do that. Um, they turned it back. Their idea of cane pruning was leaving, uh, dropping down to one cordon mm -hmm. and then leaving one extra long cane mm -hmm. to control vigor. And so we went back and said, well, that's not exactly what we were talking about. And then we described it. And they're like, well, we can't possibly do that because it will cost too much. Like they've mm -hmm. become anchored to a particular, or this particular grower, this thousand hectares of Chardonnay. Mm -hmm. There's 1.3 hectares of Fiano and they're determined to get rid of it because it's just not in that sort of perfect little matrix of X amount of money per hectare that they mm -hmm. can derive. Mm -hmm. And equally, they're trying to get the fruit off before, like as early in the season as possible mm -hmm. to decrease risk, even if they're planting a less risky grape variety for disease, mm -hmm. um, which ultimately wouldn't really impact their bottom line at all. You know, do you find that you're encountering a lot more, you know, in the industry in particular, obviously very commodity focused as you, you know, FMCG driven. They don't really respond to what I kind of think of the, the rules of wine, like mm -hmm. the rule the wine industry doesn't really operate to commodity based rules because it's not. There's two wine industries. There's the branded commodity sector, mm -hmm. which is the one we were talking about, which is things at less than ten dollars per per bottle, ten dollars US per bottle mm. in the marketplace, because that's how WSIT measures it for Australian wine, and less than ten dollars per litre uh, FOB export, and that's the non-premium wine section, and that's all inland. And the problem is that's so vast and so visible that Australia is branded as a, an industrial producer of wine from hot inland irrigation, mm. vast uh, vineyards. And that obscures because it's conflated with um, our fine wine regions, obscures Australia's fine wine position. So we've just got to find a way of, and this is what I failed at, is to make sure that the two things are viewed differently dealt with differently at uh, research and development level and at marketing level. And we focus on the expanding market of the globe, which is fine wine, mm. and we don't focus on the diminishing market in the whole globe, which is non-premium wine. Mm. It would need a lot of reform within Wine Australia for that to happen. Uh, wine Australia is just a, a, a tool. It certainly doesn't have too much influence on anything other than allocation of funds to R&D and it's now trying to starve the AWRI mm. of funding in favour of federal collaborative projects which advance the causes of, of um, the people concerned and spread the funds further into the inland and to the eastern states away from South Australia, away from the AWRI, which would be a disaster if that happens. Is it possible for inland wine, as we call it here, to make truly fine wine? Not truly fine wine, make very good wine. Um, and with Peter Dry's techniques in the vineyard and with careful, sophisticated winemaking technology, which there's no shortage of in the Riverland, you can make very good wine. But in the true sense of the word, wine to compete with the best of Burgundy, the best of Bordeaux, mm, be which difficult. is where I am, um, <laughs> where my ambition is, um, that's never going to happen in the Riverland. I mean, that's the, the very time-proven, scientifically proven difference between those climates of the cooler areas mm. and uh, the inland areas and the effect they have on great mm. quality. Well, obviously, step one, if you were, were establishing any kind of vineyard anywhere to make truly great wine would be obviously really good uh, site variety pairings, mm -hmm. matches. How do you go about that? We were always taught the homocline model. Is that the, the best sort of beginning model of that? How, what's, the, what's the approach? Well, for me, it's the other way around. I want to, wanted to grow Chardonnay so I'm going to find the place to grow Chardonnay, not find the place and then decide that Chardonnay is what should be grown there. Um, and when I, when I pioneered Foggy Hill, it was to find the place 
to grow Pinot Noir. So it was, that Noir. wasn't a retirement project that went wrong. <laughs> It is, yeah, there's no, no such thing as retirement, but um, cer- certainly it's a, sun li- it's a sunset project. Let's put it that way. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> to be absolutely fair. Because your family has uh, a pretty rich history of farming out that way. They do. Um, I think five sets of my eight great-great-grandparents arrived in this country and farmed there, so... Um, from Hindmarsh Island through to Rapid Bay, which is Crozer country. Oh, Crozer country. Mm. And sheep country, I imagine? Cattle and sheep. Um, and originally quite a lot of cropping on mm. Hindmarsh Island. and Rapid Bay. Uh, yeah. The soil ran out of nutrient and it was before the day of, um, of um, fertilisers. So they all picked up their bags and as one, all those all those families picked up their bags and went to the York Peninsula. They all used to go to the same church together, so the whole church of sort of moved to of the course. York Peninsula. Mm. And obviously you ended up in Clare Valley. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, would you – it's sort of interesting when we look at the data for Clare Valley as a sort of a region. Mm-hmm. Obviously it's known for Riesling, but it's nothing like Germany. Oh, no. no, no. So how does one arrive on, on this is the perfect place to plant Riesling there? That's experience, that's mistakes and – successes. Um, it's proven over time that it is, but it produces a very different style of Riesling to Germany mm. or to Alsace, more akin to Alsace. A little bit warmer? Yeah. Um, it, I can't explain it. It's a mystery, but it's certainly true that the Clare Valley, hot as it is, it's not extremely hot. It's um, 1700 degree days versus Germany down around 900 degree days. Alsace probably around 1100. Produces a unique, very distinctive aging Riesling that answers all of the descriptions of fine wine, Mm. which is that it is fresh, very fresh, very intense, complex. Mm -hmm. Fruit characters are not simple, they're Mm -hmm. complex. The wines are balanced. They have texture and they have length mm. and they age beautifully. So th- they are the characteristics of great wine wherever mm. it's made and certainly Riesling is great from Clare. Is, there, is the variety, uh, is great wine predicated upon the variety as well? Is there a suite of varieties that absolutely guarantee that you're going or gives you the ability to make great wine or can great wine be made from any variety as long as the, the like site? Racehorses, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Why was Farlap great? Because his genetics made him great. And um, okay. all grapes have a genetic inheritance. Um, and not only that, they have a selective inheritance. You know, you have to wonder why Riesling, a white, aromatic, highly aromatic grape, came out of Germany and spread to the edge of Germany and France mm. and in Alsace, whereas in Burgundy um, you have a much softer uh, red wine, very complex and and very comfortable red wine. And in Bordeaux, you have much more severe Cabernet, Mm. that's Pinot, much more severe Cabernet, uh, Tannic reds. That's culture. And the different cultures of Germany, Alsace, Burgundy, Bordeaux, working in selecting what works best for them to Mm. their taste and to their customers. And done over centuries, you end up with a suite of varieties which are uh, indisputably in Mm. world in global wine trade, the noble varieties. I suppose they're um, <coughs> you know, four or 500 years of hand-selective pressure yeah. without global logistics either. So it's getting a, a very intense reflection of one locality. Mm-hmm. I, I imagine all Burgundy was consumed within Burgundy until the world opened up, you know, 200 yeah. years ago. Yeah. Uh, and of course, they would have had to have mostly sol- in the monasteries, by the way. Of course, of <laughs> course, yeah. yeah. Only the church got the really good stuff. Mm. Um, the uh, I was uh, chatting to Peter Dredge the other day and something in my research came up that I, th- I just thought this would be a really fun question to ask. A bit cheeky. Obviously, you were uh, are a massive advocate for reductive winemaking. You know, some would actually protective say. Protective winemaking. We should say, yeah, protective. Reductive is probably a bit of a rude term for it. Well, no, it's not reductive, it's protective. It's protective winemaking, whereas uh, sp- obviously particularly with Riesling as well. Yep. 
Uh, whereas uh, a couple of days ago, Peter was uh, loving the idea of heavily oxidative winemaking sure. in Riesling. Yeah. Would you clip him around the ears if you saw him today? Oh, no, no, no. He's, um, he's following in a long tradition of other people who have um, made that mistake. Um, <laughs> uh, I grew up it, in California, at Davis, with a whole school of Chardonnay makers who... Um, believed in severe oxidation of juice and uh, heavy malolactic and heavy oak and trying to emulate Burgundy. And I still advocated preserving the native fruit of Chardonnay, which is what it's about from my viewpoint, which means you don't do that. You um, protect that native fruit and you don't hide it behind malolactic character, milky dairy characters or... Mm. Cha, chocolate, coffee, mocha, the... the Secondary tertiary characters. Oh, of chari yeah. oak, which is just ubiquitous, especially <laughs> in Tasmania. I just don't understand why they're covering their fruit like that. Mm. Um, that's for Peter Dredge's benefit, by the way. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, and you know what? I, I started to have doubts in the 80s and 90s with a... The protective was the way to go and I started to loosen up a bit and they would say loosen up. I would say I let go of the reins a little bit, especially from 2010 onwards I've taken back full control of the reins and we make our Chardonnays with that um, pristine um, Riesling technology, protective not reductive technology and... Our wines are really singing because of mm. it. They're pure, crystallised Piccadilly Valley Chardonnay. Mm. There's certainly some of the most uh, exciting wines that we've had out of the Adelaide Hills or even Australia, you know, just in general. I wanted to talk to you about um, obviously Petaluma is soft spot. Um, we won't delve too too much into it, but our industry and, and especially our generation are quite familiar with what happens when large companies, corporates take over beer companies. That's all been the rage really up until now. Mm-hmm. Um, not really, uh, with, the, with the exception of uh, private equity rolling up areas of the industry that we don't quite understand exactly why they're rolling it up because they're typically acquiring pretty poor brands. Um, but what happens when a winery gets taken over by a large corporate that is a high performing winery? Well, first of all, you're facing the same conveyor belt of executives who, who has decided to take it over, won't be around in five years to mm-hmm. either recognize the success or the failure of what's happened. And the second thing is the natural instinct of those people is to um, silo each of the functions Mm. of the winery that they've taken over and put marketing with their central marketing and HR with their central HR and supply of materials with whoever they've got um, in head office that does that stuff and finance, of course. And I don't have such an argument with that. (laughs) <laughs> but um, what happens is they can't deal with complexity mm. and they try and simplify everything mm. um, and centralise it. Fine wine is all about complexity and they've bought the business because it is complex. It's got lots of little vineyards. It's got lots of little batches. It's got lots of winemaking techniques. So you can't do it on scale um, mm. and you end up bottling discrete small batches of product by their standards and lots of brands, even lots mm. of SKUs. Mm. So like with Petaluma, they cut out Share Farmers, Bridgewater Mill. Mm. Um, they've turned Crozer into a um, an alternative to flavoured Ent- Entry level sparkling. Drinks. Yeah. 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 Um, Is that hard for you to swallow? <laughs> you uh, see your I'm, name? I'm divorced, I'm divorced from it except I, I often get – trapped by saying the Petaluma winery or, you know. Of course. It's part of my life from from 1976 to 2001 when the takeover happened and I continued on as winemaker after that. It doesn't cause me pain anymore. It caused me a lot of pain in 2001 when I was 53, but the rest of my life plotted out and all of a sudden I didn't have what I thought I had. To go back to what do they do? They destroy the um, the very qualities of 
that complexity confer on fine wine production and marketing mm. and those micro stories. That they're the same thing. They're, they're, they're intrinsically sort of intertwined, aren't they? Yeah, they are. Mm. What about, say, Jackson Family Vineyards? You know, they're a bit of a different model. They're a unique model. Yes, they are, and they're not far different to what we did at Petaluma or what before Petaluma Shalom did in California, which is the model I used with my good friend Jean-Michel Vallette as an advisor. Um, they have purchased good brands mm. and with vineyard, good vineyard and good winemakers and good managers, um, and they've isolated them, let them run themselves within the envelope of providing capital mm -hmm. and expecting a profit back. And otherwise they leave you to mm. develop your own vineyard, make your own wines, tell your own story, and they're masters at doing that. Gallo yeah. are very good at that too. Gallo are? Yeah. Does it, uh, when Wine Australia came out and they've, it seems to be this, this they, they panned it around as this massive success story, the we were, we were. Gallo partnership. Oh, yes. Is that a cause for concern or is it a cause for celebration? Oh, look, cracking distribution in the US, the three-tier mm. system, when we were so successful from 2000 to 2011 with wine in America promoted by Parker and then he depromoted it, but in that period we had access to the best distributors, um, the three-tier system worked for us. The moment that Shiraz became, uh, it was on the nose in America and it still is and not just Shiraz from Australia but Shiraz from San Luis Obispo and um, from other countries, even from Hermitage, we just dropped out of the market. We dropped um, from 850 million US dollars of, no, that Australian equivalent dollars of sales in 2007 down to 75 million in 2011. We seem to make a pattern of that. We do. Um, <laughs> China's another, but the Chinese course that, not us. Mm. Well, getting, getting back to Petaluma, one of the things that, because uh, uh, it, it doesn't really get spoken about much. 23 years into the journey with Petaluma when it, it, it was an, a quite aggressive takeover, wasn't it, with um, Yeah, it was, it was pretty aggressive if you look at the price. It was 33 times earnings, so it was pretty, you know, 35 times earnings. So oh, it was wow. pretty, pretty undeniable and my shareholders just mm, looked at it and said, said well, we've got to take this, yeah, we have to. It's going to take a long time for... That's tech numbers. That's yeah, that's yeah. That, that's that's very aggressive. Yeah, you were fifty three at the time, mm -hmm. uh, and I just had to sort of stop and fail them because I I know the 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 pain that I've my wife and I have gone through just with fifteen years of doing this and starting this up. <laughs> yes. You know, twenty three, and then to to have it out of your control would just it would floor me for ages. But you were you didn't stop there. You uh, believe a year after. Uh, Renovated, we'll call it, renovated the Tears Vineyard Chardonnay. Yes. Uh, the close planting block. Yeah. Uh, then the year after that became Decanter Man of the Year. Yeah. Then a couple of years after that somehow managed to buy the winery back, the facility <laughs> itself. That's my clever wife who's a <laughs> lawyer and accountant um, and a scientist. But she um, – Very talented. She um, uh, had control of the lease of the vineyard, the Tears Vineyard, and control of the road, so – between those two things, um, she managed to persuade them that they should sell it back to us, which they did in 2006. And then at, they were going to move out in three or four years and the GFC hit mm. and changed their plans, also changed our plans, by the way. Um, so uh, they stayed till 2014. And, of course, they acquired that land up the back of Woodside Way. and Built a winery for yeah. Best part of thirty million, and then sold it seven years later for eleven. <laughs> Again, that's also a bit of a, a pattern we're seeing in the industry at the moment. These really high prices being paid for for wineries or building facilities, and then selling them for fractions fractions of a dollar. Um, can you corroborate? Again, a bit of a cheeky question. I I heard a story mm -hmm. that because you controlled your house, your house is there, like right there at yeah, the, the, the winery. The vineyard, yeah. yeah, and obviously you control the road mm -hmm. going into it. 
that every time that uh, a forklift was reversing using obviously because it's pedal so it was line Nathan, mm-hmm. they, they couldn't get through, you know, some of the occupational health safety aspects that we do on a, on a smaller scale. Of course, they've got the reversing beepers and all the forklifts that every time that they reverse past their, the time that uh, they were allowed to, a complaint was lodged. No, that's not true. That is absolutely not true. We're pretty insulated from the noise of the winery um, in most circumstances, except for when there's a south wind, uh, north wind rather. Um, there is some truth to the fact that we wouldn't allow them to start a cellar door, mm-hmm. um, wouldn't allow them to um, use the tears appellation on anything other than tears fruit um, and uh, yeah and pretty much they had we also said they had to use the transport company that we'd use the Watton family from the Piccadilly Valley or the mm-hmm. Cherry family grape growers mm-hmm. oh yes no no very well yeah yes sellers. they'd been with us since we started in 79 so one of the conditions was that they should stay as the transport drivers because they knew how to get down the drive silently without <laughs> using <laughs> engine brakes. So, um, yeah, there were some tough restrictions, but um, in general, we didn't. We weren't hostile. You don't strike me as a hostile. They were burden. hostile. They were very hostile when um, when we started to negotiate to buy the winery back. Another thing that came in my research that uh, often doesn't sort of really get, get spoken about is in all the projects you're on, you're involved in a lot. You know, you mentioned share farmers, there's Bridgewater Mill, uh, obviously sort of different brands. There's obviously the Crozer brand, mm-hmm. uh, Petaluma, Argyle, um, mm-hmm. you know, over in, in uh, the Oregon. States. Yeah, Tunkalilla in Oregon. Tunkalilla, yeah. of course, mm-hmm. as well. Seven in all. Seven in all, there was. Uh, you know, I... I get the sense that you are a bit of a serial entrepreneur as well, mm. but often, and it seems like almost always the case, you involve partners, obviously, in what you do. Mm-hmm. Probably one of the toughest things to do, I think, in the, the wine industry, particularly because margins are relatively thin, is involving partners. How do you get that partnership to work? Why And why? And, and you, you partner with some amazing people yeah. as well. Yeah, I- I support that, by the way, that uh, I did partner with some amazing people. We needed the capital. We didn't have the capital to do build the bridge, rebuild the Bridgewater Mill, to mm. plant the vineyards in the Piccadilly Valley, to start the Crozer Project. I didn't have the p- capital to start Argyle and do the same thing in Oregon. So I had to have partners with capital. But I always, always chose partners and convinced partners to join us who had much more to offer than just the capital. Mm. So I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, two of the greatest mentors in my life were Christian Bezo, who's the other grandfather of some of my grandchildren, Zavra and Lucy's children, um, who's perished in 2003, unfortunately. He uh, taught me how to market wine around the globe because Bollinger do that so well and he was Very the chairman so. of Bollinger and he put me on the board of Menzendorf in London, which is their distribution company with Taylors of Portugal and on the board of Dreyfus Ashby with Druan in, in New York. So he, he, he created opportunity for me to broaden my experience and he himself mentored me in a serious way. Another mentor was Carl Knudsen, who was our partner and chairman in Oregon, in Argyle, you know, in the big vineyard mm. in, um, in the Willamette Valley in Dundee Hills. He had been secretary when he was behaving to Nixon <laughs> as kidding. president. Yeah, he had been the, the secretary for a period of time and he'd also headed up two of the biggest lumber companies in Canada and Northwest America. He, he's an, or he came from uh, Seattle and his best friend at school was Bill Gates' father. They did law together. So a really serious, heavy-hitting American businessman, lovely person. 
and he taught me what there is to know about doing business in, a, in America, which is far different to doing business here in Australia. We're kinder to one another here than they are there. Here Very we much. tend to create a bigger pie and everybody gets a yeah. bit of the bigger pie. There it is simply dog eat dog, you know. It's competition. A, a comp- they're, heavy they're, they're, competition. They are bred from uh, yeah. being in school. It's all about competition. Yeah. yeah. And um, Cal... Cal taught me a lot about how to handle that. It's 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 for it's not for everyone. Uh, we've got a couple of uh, guys on the road for us that we we fly across there, and of course, you know, Laura and I do a lot of work there. Uh, it can be a lot of fun if you're into that, you know. But it's uh, it is it's it's at least the thing that I appreciate about American business though is that there's not a lot that they'll hide in that respect. Mm. You know, you often need to look at other cues in Australia, whereas there it is literally about the dollar and that's about it. Yes. Yeah. You know, at least it's honest. They're very innovative. I really admire their farming culture. They've got a wonderful engineering farming culture. couple of questions to round us off. Mm-hmm. What would be the top three things that you think the broader one or the global one industry should be working on right now? Same problems that Australia has because globally um, fine wine is advancing by 2.2% a year and um, non-premium wine is going backwards by about the same amount and that's mm. that's a decades-long trajectory mm. and the world has to work out um, how to um, manage the surplus vineyard, surplus grapes that come out of that disparity because the premium market's so much smaller, even though it's growing at the same rate, it's obviously not taking up the same number of grapes as as is being set free by the diminishing non-premium market. So that that's a global problem. And as I said, EU solve it one way. In the US, the farmers are wonderful. They just look at it and say, well, I'm going to pull them all out and plant almonds tomorrow or olives mm. or whatever, capsicum. So that's the thing of the day. There's a shortage of capsicums in America at the moment. And here we're stuck with the problem. Um, So that's – and I'm not going to name three things globally. Um, uh, Transport is an issue globally. But for us here, it is really about getting rid of that 400,000 tonne surplus. Mm -hmm. It's about um, uh, promoting our fine wines, our regions, our terroirs, our fine wine stories instead of spending money on a brand Australia, which means nothing to anybody Mm. and conflates non-premium wine with premium wine. And if you want three things, um, I'll bring it down to three things, which is quality, quality, quality. Um, Mm. We have to keep improving quality, um, relentlessly improve quality in from our vineyards and our wineries. And most of that quality improvement will come from vineyards, choice of region, choice of variety within region, choice of planting regime, choice of management techniques because we're nowhere near as fastidious as the people in Napa or in Willamette Valley and obviously not as in Bordeaux or Burgundy. Mm. We're, not, we're not putting the same effort into our vineyards. So we've got to, we've got to turn that around. As, as simple a solution as this is and also equally devastating, mm-hmm. what about just controls around irrigation? I don't want to get into the argument about whether irrigation is good or bad. Ideologically, you could say, well, you're taking water away from the environment, um, you're changing the soil structure and all of that. Um, And I think there is an argument for that in the Riverland that less water is better for quality out of the Riverland. Well, you'd find out what you'd be able to grow. Mm -hmm. If you couldn't irrigate your back garden, you'd very quickly figure out what will and won't grow. Yeah, it probably wouldn't be grapevines in most cases. Yeah, mm. probably wipe out a lot of surplus. <laughs> <laughs> no, in, from back gardens I'm talking about. Of course. Um, irrigation is a broad concept. If a vineyard is totally dependent on heavy irrigation, that's not good. Um, I'm not going to say it's bad. But supplementary irrigation as we would have in mm. the Adelaide Hills to cope with dry conditions. Mm. And I can't think of a single soil in the Adelaide Hills that would stand a, a, a drought without supplementary irrigation. Jeffrey Weaver would argue because his vineyard at Lenswood, he runs without 
irrigation, but occasionally irrigates. I don't see it as an ideological problem. Um, I think irrigation fit, fits in. And the Europeans are now desperate mm. to get it legitimised in mm. the face of climate change because they know um, their evaporative demand is going to go up and mm. uh, the temperature is going to go up, so they need more. What do you think about Bordeaux's approach to, well, if they can't just irrigate, they're just going to change the variety, you know, bringing in Tariga yeah, and yeah, the likes? Yeah, that's not really, yeah, it's not just about irrigation. That's about um, uh, fruit quality coping with climate change. Mm. So they've introduced some Portuguese varieties and some varieties from Italy, I think, mm. that um, are more drought tolerant but not totally drought tolerant but have characteristics that um, – and I think the best example of that would be Tariga Nacional, which I think is one of the great noble varieties. It copes with lots of heat in the Douro and very dry conditions beautifully. We've been looking very closely at Portuguese varieties recently. One of the mm. ones that uh, we're looking to import uh, is Encruzado. All right. It's an amazing white variety, uh, very reminiscent of, of Chardonnay. From but, which uh, part of Portugal? From the Dow. Okay. Um, absolutely incredible. But we are largely on time or probably over time, I imagine. Uh, one last question. So obviously with a uh, just a hit list of people that you have mentored, you know, Martin Shaw, uh, mm-hmm. Anna Martins, Peter Dredge, um, uh, Dean Hewitson as mm-hmm. well. I sent him off to Davis and paid for him to go there. <laughs> I'm not sure I sent to Bordeaux. Well, hey, you know, hey, and then he came back, started Shaw and Smith. Uh, Peter Dredge did, you know, amazing work uh, at Bay of Fires, then, of course, under his own sort of label now. Mm-hmm. Anna Martins out of Vina Diana, uh, mm-hmm. you know, amazing um, uh, set up with Carve de Perenne mm-hmm. as well. What would be your advice to a budding young winemaker these days, come fresh out of, of college? <laughs> vineyard, vineyard, vineyard. Again, like quality, quality, quality. Your reputation as a winemaker eventually will depend on the quality of uh, vineyard that you have and um, how it fits your purpose, Um, the terroir. And that leads to a second thing, which I would say is subjugate your your winemaking ego and make the vineyard the hero, not yourself, which is pretty hard for young people to do. Um, (laughs) And the third thing would be step up and provide some leadership to the industry um, because A, you owe it to the industry and B, the industry will be improved by it. And now I'm talking about custodianship of research and development and education and mm. all those things. Um, step up and Do you help. think there's a lack of youth representation in sort of regulatory bodies like Why Australia? Yeah, serious. And it's been, when, when I say lack of, that's been going on for 30 years. So some of the people who were absent as young winemakers 30 years ago and our senior winemakers and they're still absent, which mm. really um, frustrates me because um, we have so much to do. I think it's a lack of appetite for getting involved in what, what can be perceived to be just very boring politics. Well, it's not boring in any way, shape or form, but it's, if you're selfish and you're really looking at your own business and that's the, the core and you don't want to get involved in anything else, that's, that's what really drives the lack of leadership is mm. people... Um, not wanting to sacrifice their own time uh, or mental energy Mm. on industry issues, which they would see as frustrating and repetitive over a long period of time. And they're right on both those things. Well, yeah. Brennan Carter for CEO of Wine Australia, uh, 2025. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Brian, thank you so much for your time today. Is there anything else that you would like to add? Nope. Nope. That's it. Nope. Nope. Thank you. Okay.